Hello and welcome to MK Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at chronic leukemias. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's If you haven't yet watched the video on acute leukemias, I will leave a card right here that you can click on right now to watch the videos on acute leukemia. I'll also leave a link in the description as well as the end at the end of the video for you to check out acute leukemias before you actually transition to watching chronic leukemias. So let me give you a background before we actually continue. Remember that blood is pretty much connective tissue that's found in fluid form. It's going to be consisting of plasma. It's going to be consisting of formed elements. The plasma is going to obviously be made up of plasma proteins, water, electrolytes, a complement system, as well as coagulation factors. Then, of course, the formed elements are going to be your red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells or leukocytes, platelets or thrombocytes, or you can refer to them as megakaryocytes. Now, remember that all these formed elements are going to be pretty much arising from a special type of stem cell, which is known as a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Now, remember that stem cells are pretty much any cell that has the ability to give rise to many different cell lineages while it's maintaining its own population. Now, this pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell is pretty much going to be dividing into one of two cells, either a myeloid progenitor cell, which is pretty much going to be giving rise to the myeloid cells or the myeloid cell lineage, as well as the lymphoid progenitor cell, which is pretty much going to be giving rise to the lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes, and the natural killer cells, which are neither B or T lymphocytes. Then pretty much all the other cells, the red blood cells, the granulocytes and megakaryocytes as well as the macrophages are going to be arising from the myeloid progenitor cell. So the myeloid progenitor cell is going to be giving rise to the red blood cells, the platelets, the monocytes, the eosinophils, basophils as well as in the neutrophils. Then, of course, the lymphoid progenitor cell is going to be giving rise to the B cells, the T cells, and the natural killer cells. Here's a schematic. Here you have a, hem a hemocytoblast, which is a multipotent hematopoietic stem cell, giving rise to a common myeloid progenitor cell and a common lymphoid progenitor cell. The common lymphoid progenitor cell can give rise to a small lymphocyte or a natural killer cell, which is known as a large granular lymphocyte. The small lymphocytes can be of two types. B lymphocytes, which are eventually once activated, going to differentiate into plasma cells that produce antibodies. Then you also have T lymphocytes. Now, these lymphocytes are very important, especially in the immune system. Then, of course, the common myeloid progenitor cell is going to be given rise to the megakaryocytes that eventually form thrombocytes or platelets that are essential for blood clotting, erythrocytes, which are essential for carrying oxygen as well as carbon dioxide, then mast cells, as well as uh, myeloblasts, which are pretty much going to be giving rise to basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, which can leave the bloodstream to become macrophages in their different respective tissues. Now, keep this diagram and this schematic in mind, because when you talk about a leukemia, this is just pretty much a malignant condition that's going to be arising from excessive proliferation of immature or abnormal leukocytes. They sometimes may be mature leukocytes. Now, most of these leukemias are going to be arising from the hematopoietic stem cells proliferating in the bone marrow initially, and then they may disseminate to other places. They may disseminate to the peripheral blood. They may disseminate to the lymph nodes. They may disseminate to the spleen as well as to the liver. Now, remember that the big difference between Lymphomas and leukemias is this. Lymphomas are pretty much going to be found primarily in solid organs, so pretty much the lymph nodes, but they can also spread to the blood and they can also spread to the bone marrow in what is known as an acute leukemic or rather a leukemic phase of the disease. Now, remember that leukemias can be classified based on the cell origin. They can be classified as myeloid leukemias. They can be classified as lymphoid leukemias. Then they can also be classified based on the clinical course of the disease. This is pretty much based on the percentage of the blasts 
or the leukemic cells in the bone marrow or the blood. You can refer to the acute leukemias, which we covered in the previous lecture on acute leukemias. And then today we're going to be focusing pretty much on chronic leukemias. So in short, you have predominantly four main types of leukemias. Acute myelogenous or myeloid leukemias, which are the most common, 33%. Chronic myelogenous or myeloid leukemias, which are account for about 14%. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is accounting for 10%. And correction is the chronic lymphocytic or lymphoid leukemias, which are accounting for about 35%, not the 33%. Take note of that. So these are the four predominant types of leukemias. We already discussed the acute variants and I'm pretty sure by now you have a very good understanding about acute leukemias. Today we're going to be focusing pretty much on chronic leukemias, beginning with the two main types of our chronic leukemias, pretty much your chronic myeloid leukemia and your chronic lymphoid or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now we'll begin with chronic myeloid leukemia. Remember that this is going to be a disease that's going to be affecting predominantly older adults. You're going to be having this clonal expansion of hematopoietic cells of myeloid origin that are going to be possessing the Philadelphia chromosome. I'll tell you what the Philadelphia chromosome is. And actually, more than 90% of the patients that have chronic myeloid leukemia have a positive Philadelphia chromosome. I'll tell you what exactly is the role of this Philadelphia chromosome. And if we actually don't treat the chronic myeloid leukemia, it's going to undergo three main phases. There's what is known as the chronic phase the accelerated phase, and the blast phase. So remember that chronic myeloid leukemia affects more men than it does affect women. And of course, the incidence increases slowly with age until someone reaches the mid-40s where the incidence begins to rapidly rise. The average age of most patients that have chronic myeloid leukemia is roughly around 64 years. And in majority of the cases, we actually don't know what is causing the leukemia. But what is believed is that chronic myeloid leukemia is one of the leukemias that has actually been observed with increased prevalence following the atomic ex explosion that has happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So just keep that uh, prospect in mind. Now, what is exactly is happening in these individuals that have um, chronic myeloid leukemia? So remember that most of the cases, 90 to 95% of the cases have a Philadelphia chromosome. So the Philadelphia chromosome is just simply a product of a reciprocal translocation. So you have some material that's going to be translocated from chromosome 9 to chromosome 22. So you get a piece of chromosome 9 that's going to be containing the oncogene, which is known as ABL. Now remember that an oncogene is uh, pretty much a gene that is going to be uh, causing uh, cancer or has the propensity to cause cancer. So you get this oncogene, which is the ABL, and it's going to be moved and fused to chromosome 22. Uh, chromosome 22 has what is known as the BCR gene. So you will form uh, what is known as the BCR-ABL uh, complex. Now, this complex that you're formed on this gene is what is known as your Philadelphia chromosome. Now, the reason why this is important is because you're going to form this BCR-ABL. Remember that genes are going to be coding for certain proteins. Now, one of the proteins that is going to be produced is an oncoprotein, which is known as the BCR-ABL tyrosine kinase, or in other words, you can refer to it as the P210 or P210 tyrosine kinase. Now, what does this protein do? It carries out certain things. Number one, it's going to be deregulating the cellular proliferation. Number two, it's going to be decreasing the adherence of these leukemic cells to the bone marrow stroma. So it means that these cells can easily actually leave the bone marrow and go into the bloodstream. Then, of course, it also protects the cells from actually killing themselves. Because remember that during the cell cycle, if there is a problem in the genetic material of the cell, it's going to kill itself by a process that's known as apoptosis, or you can think of it as cell suicide. Now, because of this protein that is now being formed, the cell is now incapable of actually killing itself. So it will keep dividing. And once it keeps dividing, this is what is leading to the increase in these leukemic cells. So remember that in chronic myeloid leukemias, you have an abnormal proliferation or um, you have an abnormal pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell that initiates excessive production of the myeloid linear cells. And primarily, this is going to be occurring in the bone marrow, but it may be seen in also other extramedullary sites like the spleen and the liver. So it means that in those patients, you would expect some splenomegaly, you would expect some hepatomegaly. Then, of course, the granulocytes may predominate. Uh, the neoplastic clones include things like red blood cells, megakaryocytes, monocytes, and even sometimes B cells cells and T cells can be seen as these abnormal leukemic cells. And remember that once you treat this patient and this patient actually 
goes into remission and they are suppressed by certain drugs, they may actually have the normal stem cells actually returning their function in the bone marrow. Now, what are some of the clinical features and, and phases that these patients undergo? So if a patient actually doesn't get treatment for chronic myeloid leukemia, they're pretty much going to undergo three predominant phases, like I already explained earlier on. There's what is known as the chronic phase, there's what is known as the accelerated phase, and there's what is known as the blastic phase. So in the chronic phase, this is like a slow period. It's indolent, it's gradual, and it's going to be lasting about five to six years. Then, of course, they will progress into treatment failure if they are on some treatment and, and if it's not effective, they may have worsening anemia, they may have progressive thrombocytopenia or thrombocytosis where there isn't either a decrease in the platelet count or an increase in the platelet count. They may have persistent or even worsening splenomegaly, they may have clonal evolution and of course there's going to be an increase in the number of basophils, an increase in the number of marrow as well as the blood blast cells up to about 19%. Now, beyond this, these blast cells can actually begin to accumulate in the extramedullary site. So meaning they can ac accumulate in the bones, they can accumulate in the central nervous system, they can accumulate in the lymph nodes, even in the skin. And remember that the blast cells in the blood and in the bone marrow are increased to greater than 20%. That was the hallmark that we actually used when we're diagnosing acute leukemia. So in the plastic phase, this is very similar to the uh, what we actually see in acute leukemias. And in most cases, this phase is actually going to be leading to permanent complications that are obvious resembling acute leukemia. So things like sepsis and bleeding because the bone marrow will lose its capability to synthesize red blood cells, to synthesize white blood cells, and to synthesize platelets because all it keeps making are these blast cells. Now, some patients may actually progress directly from this chronic phase and actually pass the accelerated phase and straight into the blastic phase. Now, beginning with our chronic phase, remember that this has a very gradual onset, so it's insidious. Most of the patients are actually found in this phase. About 85 of the percent of the patients with chronic myeloid leukemias are found in this phase and they're usually asymptomatic. If they have symptoms, they may sometimes be nonspecific. So they may have things like fatigue, weakness, anorexia, weight loss, night sweats. They may sometimes have a sense of abdominal fullness, particularly in the left upper quadrant. They may have left upper quadrant abdominal dull pain. They may have early satiety, meaning getting full very quickly. And of course, this is obviously attributed to an enlarged spleen. And other Features may include things like a gouty arthritis, symptoms of leuco, uh, leukocytosis. I think this should have been leukostasis, not leukocytosis. Leukostasis. So things like tinnitus, which is a, this ringing sound that you have in the ear, stupor, uticaria, which may prompt further investigations. Then, of course, a few of these cases may actually be related to granulocyte and even platelet dysfunction. Because if you don't have granulocytes, you're not able to fight off infections. If you're, your platelets aren't working very well, then there may actually be some recurrent infections, there may be some thrombosis. Sometimes this may actually manifest as cerebrovascular accidents or strokes. Um, you may, if you're a male, you may actually have this persistent painful erection of the penis, which is referred to as priapism. Now, in the accelerated and the blastic phase, where they undergo this transformation into this blast crisis, they may actually progress from the chronic phase where they now develop certain severe symptoms like unexplained fevers, progressive weight loss, bone and joint pains, bleeding or thrombosis, recurrent infections, and of course, increasing dose requirements for the drugs that they're used to control the disease. Then about 10 to 15% of the patients may actually present for the first time with either the accelerated phase or even in the blast transformation phase. Now, what you really need to note is that initially, these individuals may actually have pallor, bleeding, easy bruising, and lymphadenopathy, which are quite unusual, but moderately or occasionally they may have extreme splenomegaly, and this is common. In about 60 to 70% of the cases, splenomegaly may actually be the first thing that may take your mind that this person may actually have a chronic myeloid leukemia. Then, of course, with disease progression, splenomegaly may actually increase and the pallor and bleeding may actually occur because you are you're decreasing your level of the red blood cells, you're decreasing the level of your platelets. Then, of course, fever, market lymphadenopathy, and macular popular skin involvement are usually some signs that obviously are almost going to develop most of the times in these patients. Now, on your physical examination, in the early stage, 90% of the patients are going to have moderately pale conjunctiva. Then, of course, there may be an enlarged spleen and a mild liver enlargement. And then late in the disease process, patients may actually develop lymph node enlargement. They may have uh, chloromas, which are pretty much leukemic deposits in the skin. They may also have a tender sternum.
How do we make a diagnosis? So there are some investigations that we would order. A full blood count with a differential would obviously be your first step. Do not forget to get a peripheral smear, bone marrow examination, as well as cytogenetic studies where you want to check for your BCRABL gene. You want to check for your Philadelphia chromosome. Then most patients that have chronic uh, myeloid leukemia uh, is, is going to be suspected based on an abnormal full blood count. Or even incidentally, when you're examining the patient, it could be for something else. Then they actually, you notice that they have a massive splenomegaly. Then of course, what do you expect to see on your full blood count? So the granulocyte count is often elevated. So usually less than 50,000 cells per microliter of blood in asymptomatic patients. And it can be as high as 200,000 to even 1 million um, cells per microliter in symptomatic patients. So the white blood cell count could be actually very high. Then, of course, they may have neutrophilia with a left shift in the white blood cell differential. It means that most of the neutrophils are going to be immature. If you have a left shift, you may have basophilia, which is an increase in basophils. You may also have an increase in eosinophils. Then, of course, you may also have an increase in monocytosis. And basophilia and monocytosis are actually commonly associated with an accelerated phase as well as the plastic phase. And of course, the platelets may be normal or moderately elevated. And in some patients, thrombocytosis is actually the single presenting feature that they actually come in with. And of course, the red blood cells and hemoglobin levels are going to be low and they may present to you with anemia. When you actually do a peripheral smear, this is actually going to help you differentiate between chronic myeloid leukemia and other causes of leukocytosis. Now, in chronic myeloid leukemia, the white blood cell count is obviously going to be increased with a variable degree amount of maturity, meaning that there are going to be some mature neutrophils, there are going to be some band forms, which are immature red blood cells that are, I mean, immature uh, neutrophils, which are pretty much going to be seen in the peripheral blood smear. So these immature granulocytes are going to include things like promyelocytes, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, which are pretty much going to be seen with increased number in the films. Now, depending on the percentage of the myeloblasts that are present on your film, this may actually help you distinguish which phase this patient may actually be in. So if the blasts are less than 5% of the granulocytes in the uh, blood, then they may be in the chronic phase. If they are greater than 15%, but less than 30%, so 15 to 30% of the granulocytes in the, the blood cells are uh, between this range of the granulocytes and the blood, then they are in the accelerated phase. If they're greater than 30%, then of course they are in the blastic phase. Now remember that the phagocytic function is normal at diagnosis and remains normal even in the chronic phase. When you do your bone marrow aspiration, you get an increase in cellularity, uh, primarily uh, of the myeloid as well as the megakaryocyte lineage, and the percentage of the bone marrow uh, blasts remains normal or even slightly increased. When you perform your cytogenetic studies, like I told you, the diagnosis is pretty much going to be confirmed by finding your Philadelphia chromosome in your samples that you take for cytogenetic and even molecular studies. Now, the classic Philadelphia chromosome abnormality is absent in about 5% of patients, um, but the use of other techniques such as a fluorescein uh, in situ hybridization or fish testing, as well as reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction can actually confirm the diagnosis in patients that have a negative Philadelphia chromosome. Now, the, there may be some stage-dependent findings on your examination. So if a patient is in the chronic phase, they'll have less than 5% of the circulating blasts. Less than 10% of the blasts plus the promyelocytes in the blood. The platelet count may be increased. They may have mild anemia. And of course, on your bone marrow examination, there will be increased cellularity of the bone marrow with a normal or even an increase in the percentage of the blast cells. Then if they're in the accelerated phase, you will get a worsening anemia. You may get blasts between 15 to 30% of the granulocytes in the blood or bone marrow. You may get blasts and promyelocytes that are greater than 30% of the granulocytes in the blood or bone marrow. You may also get basophils that are greater than than 20% of the granulocytes. Your platelet count would be less than 100,000. Then of course, the blastic crisis, you get blasts that are greater than 30% of the granulocytes in the bone marrow or blood, the hypo-segmented neutrophils. Then of course, you have to take note that the blast cells can be myeloid in 50%, like in uh, acute myeloid leukemias. They can be lymphoid in 30%, erythroid in 10%, sometimes even undifferentiated in 10% of the cases. Now, how do we manage these patients that have chronic uh, 
myeloid leukemia. Remember that the goal is actually to attain molecular remission and a cure. So achieving prolonged durable neoplastic as well as non, uh, non-clonal hematopoiesis. So the treatment, we can use either some drugs, chemotherapy. The drugs that we're using currently are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are the first line. Then if this fails, we can actually use bone marrow transplant or an allogenic stem cell transplant. Then we'll begin with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So this includes drugs like imatinib, nilotinib, dasatinib, uh, bosutinib, as well as ponatinib. Okay, so what is the mechanism of of action of these drugs? Remember that the main problem in chronic myeloid leukemias is that you had a part of the gene from chromosome 9 translocated into chromosome 22, forming what is known as a BCR ABL uh, oncogene. So pretty much these drugs are going to be inhibiting that BCR. Are ABL oncogen, and pretty much this is going to prevent the induction of the chronic myeloid leukemia. So these cells that have this mutation do not keep proliferating; they will eventually die. So remember that this is not actually curable; it's not a curative kind of mechanism, but it's extremely effective. It's extremely effective in patients that are in the asymptomatic chronic phase. It's the initial uh, treatment of choice. It can also be used in patients that are in the accelerated as well as the blastic phase. Now, these drugs, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have actually been shown to prolong survival of patients. And some patients have actually discontinued the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and have remained in remission. So in in short, they uh, quote unquote have been somehow cured. Uh, Remember that in most cancers, we don't say that this person is completely cured because there is a propensity of it actually coming back. Then the durability of actually these remissions is not yet known. And these drugs are actually have been found to be much more superior to other drugs that are being used like interferons with or without cytarabine. Then, of course, the response to these drugs is the most important prognostic factor in patients that have CML. So it means if this person responds very well, the survival rates are very high, very good. And of course, the prognosis is good. Then... If we're monitoring these patients, we want to do quantitative reversive transcriptase uh, or transcription PCR. We can do this three monthly, but of course, because of the expensiveness of the test, it's not really feasible in our setting, but you should get weekly full blood counts when the patient is on treatment. And you should be seeing a drop in the white blood cell count. You should see an increase in the red blood cell count, an increase in the HB. You should also see an increase or normalization of the platelet count. Other drugs that actually have been used as palliation in chronic myeloid leukemia include hydroxyurea, busulfan, uh, recombinant interferon or uh, pegylated uh, interferon. So the main benefit is obviously going to be attributed to hydroxyurea, which has been shown to decrease splenomegaly as well as the adenopathy. And of course, it can control the burden uh, of the tumor to reduce the chance of this patient developing tumor lysis syndrome and even gout. Because remember that the main complication of these patients that have um, cancers and actually on treatment with chemotherapy is remember these cancers are killing off these cells. These chemotherapy is killing off these cells. And once the cell has been killed off, it releases all its material into the bloodstream. So it means these people will have a high concentration of potassium. They'll have high concentration of urea. So this predisposes them to develop various manifestations and various other complications, which is referred to as tumor lysis syndrome. So these drugs, these other drugs that I mentioned here are not going to prolong the survival, but with the interferon, there is actually some clinical remission that we have noted in about 19% of the patients. And patients that actually are in the accelerated or the blastic phase of chronic myeloid leukemia or those that do not respond to the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we can actually perform an allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, which has been shown to be curative in some cases. But of course, The prognosis largely depends on whether this patient is Philadelphia chromosome positive or negative. If they are negative, then this is a worse prognosis. But the five-year survival rate uh, is 90%, but uh, complete BC. Uh, BCR and ABL eradication is very rare in less than 5% of the patients. And in patients that actually have the transplantation, the bone marrow transplant, after five years, the uh, remain... um, completely free of the cancer in 60% if the bone marrow was actually gotten from a sibling and 40% if they are unrelated. Now we move on to chronic lymphoid leukemias. Now remember that this is actually the most common type of leukemia in the West world. And the average age of these patients is roughly around 70 years. This is actually quite an aggressive type of uh, leukemia because with this type of leukemia, there actually is no cure. So with chronic lymphocytic or lymphoid type of leukemia, it's extremely rare in children. 
And the average lifetime risk of this increases in both sexes by about 0.57%. And it's much more common in males than it is in females. So this is actually quite an incurable disease of older patients. And it's going to be characterized by this uncontrolled proliferation and accumulation of these mature B lymphocytes. 98% of the cases of chronic lymphoid leukemias are attributed to these B lymphocytes, but you may sometimes get in some isolated cases where you get these T lymphocytes. Now, remember the, the main difference between lymphomas and leukemias. With lymphomas, you have these malignant cells accumulating in the lymphoid tissues. But then with these leukemias, you have these malignant blastic cells accumulating in the bone marrow, accumulating in the blood, but sometimes they can also infiltrate the lymph nodes. Now, in this type of cancer, this may actually progress and actually become a lymphoma. So with chronic lymphoid or chronic lymphocytic leukemias, it may progress and give you a lymphoma. So the disease remains asymptomatic in a proportion of the cases, but they may develop symptoms of anemia, infection, and bleeding because of the bone marrow failure. And of course, um, in the common majority of the uh, patients may present with these three features, just like we discussed with acute leukemias. The exact cause of this, just like with the chronic myeloid leukemia, is largely unknown. But in some individuals, we have actually seen some hereditary components that have actually been implicated. Now, what's the pathophysiology of this condition? Remember that you have this CD5 positive B cells that undergo malignant transformation. So these same CD5 positive B cells are going to be continuously activated by a number of mutations, some of which I won't mention, that are pretty much going to be leading to monoclonal B lymphocytosis, where you have one specific type of cell replicating itself multiple times. So you, you make a whole colony of just one single cell. Then you have this further accumulation of these genetic abnormalities and subsequent on oncogenic transformation of these monoclonal B cells. And then eventually this is going to lead to chronic lymphocytic leukemias. Now remember that these lymphocytes initially are going to be found in the bone marrow. Then they're going to be spreading to the lymph nodes and then they may spread to other lymphoid tissues, eventually causing the, the clinical features, causing the splenomegaly, the hepatomegaly, the systemic symptoms such as fatigue, fever, night sweats, early satiety, and even unintentional weight loss. Now remember, as the chronic lymphocytic leukemia progresses, abnormal hematopoiesis is pretty much going to result in anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and a decreased immunoglobulin production. So this means that this individual is going to present to you with features of anemia. They're going to present to you with bleeding tendencies. They're going to present to you with, of course, recurrent infections. Now remember that hypoagammaglobulinemia, which is a decrease in the antibodies, can actually develop in about two thirds of the patients. And this actually increases the risk for infections, pretty much viral infections like VZV, pneumonias are very common. So patients have an increased susceptibility to autoimmune hemolytic anemias. So they will have a positive Coombs test, a direct anti-globulin test. And then of course, they may have autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Now, what you really need to note is that, like I said earlier on, chronic lymphocytic leukemia or chronic lymphoid leukemia can transform into a higher grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So you may evolve into a B-cell uh, pro-lymphocytic leukemia, which is going to eventually transform into a higher grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We'll cover lymphomas in another episode. So in about 2 to 10% of patients that have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, they're going to develop diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, which are pretty much referred to as Richter's transformation. Now, how do we classify these type of leukemias? They can be classified pretty much into three suggested types. You have the typical CALs where you have more than 95% of the lymphocytes in the blood, which are small lymphocytes. You have the pro-lymphocytic CALs which, where you have more than 51% of the lymphocytes in the blood being pro-lymphocytes. Then, of course, the atypical uh, COL, which you have less than 10% of the lymphocytes in the blood, are actually small lymphocytes. Now, what are some of the clinical features? Remember, this is going to be following an insidious course. So this is very gradual. In about 25% of the uh, cases, the diagnosis is actually made accidentally in an asymptomatic patient. And you only do this where you have an abnormal white blood cell count. So patients may have nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, weakness, anorexia, weight loss, fever, and even night sweats, which may actually prompt further evaluation. Now, the majority of the features are going to be resulting from two things. They're going to be resulting either from tissue infiltration by these leukemic cells, or they're going to be resulting from pretty much bone marrow suppression with peripheral blood cytopenias and immunosuppression. 
Now, what are some of these symptoms? You may have recurrent infections. Like I told you, varicella zoster virus, even some pneumonias. This is actually resulting from neutropenia and reduced antibody levels. Then, of course, you may have symptoms of anemia because they have a drop in the red blood cell and the hemoglobin. You may have painless enlargement of the lymph nodes. This lymphadenopathy tends to be localized, affecting the cervical and the supraclavicular lymph nodes most commonly. You may have splenomegaly and you may have hepatomegaly. Some of the signs include anemia, enlarged lymph nodes, and enlarged spleen, and an enlarged liver. Then, of course, what investigations are we going to do? So we want to do a full blood count, of course, with your differential count. You want to order for a peripheral smear. You want to do flow cytometry of the peripheral blood. You may do immunophenotyping. And, of course, bone marrow examination is not really important for a diagnosis in the case of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. You may also order for serum immunoglobulins and even a Coombs test. So on your full blood count, the first suspicion that you're going to get is if you get an absolute peripheral lymphocytosis, where you get a lymphocyte count that is greater than 5,000 cells per microliter. This is usually going to be ticking your mind that this person could have a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Remember, this should be persistent for greater than three months for you to make a diagnosis. And the hemoglobin may be normal or low. Your white blood cell count will be greater than 15,000 of which 40% of these are going to be lymphocytes, with a minimum of 5,000 of them being mature lymphocytes in the circulation. And of course, the platelet count may be low in 15% of the cases, or it may be normal. Remember, I said your bone marrow examination in, is not really... Uh, uh, really important for your diagnosis, but if you do a bone marrow aspirate or a biopsy, 30% of the cellular elements would be mature B cells. You may also do flow cytometry and peripheral blood as well as immunophenotyping. Uh, so pretty much the circulating lymphocytes are going to be positive for the following things. They're going to have CD5, CD19, CD20, CD23, kappa, as well as lambda-like chains. And then, of course, cytogenetic and molecular studies are done from the peripheral blood at the time of diagnosis, and this can actually help in determining the prognosis. Other investigations, you may have a low serum immunoglobulins, or they may sometimes be normal. A Coombs test may be positive, indicating autoimmune type of hemolytic anemia. Of course, you may have hypo or gamma globulinemia in less than 15% of the cases, elevated levels of lactate dehydrogenase, elevated levels of uric acid, elevated hepatic enzymes. And of course, rarely you may have hypercalcemia. How do we stage this disease? There are two staging systems. There's what is known as the RAI staging. Uh, classification is what is known as the BINET staging. So in this classification, you pretty much have uh, five phases, stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. So stage zero, you have lymphocytosis. And remember, lymphocytosis is you have a white blood cell count greater than 15,000, of which 40% of them are lymphocytes. So you have lymphocytosis and only this is affecting the blood and the bone marrow. In stage two, this is affecting the lymph nodes. In stage um, stage one, rather, in stage two, this is affecting the liver and the spleen. In stage three, this is affecting the uh, HB. So you have an HB that's less than 11 grams per deciliter. And of course, in stage four, you have thrombocytopenia. That's a platelet count that's less than 100,000. Now, remember that the cervical, axillary, and inguinal lymph node groups, unilateral or bilateral, the spleen and the liver are each counted as one area. Then, of course, in the binet staging, you have the three stages, stage A, stage B, and and stage C. So in stage A, you have equal or less than three involved um, lymphoid areas. And then, of course, the HB greater than 10. In stage B, you have greater than or equal to three uh, lymphoid areas involved with a platelet count that's less than 100,000. In stage C, you have any of the involved uh, with uh, an HB that's less than 10 grams per deciliter and a platelet count that's less than 100,000 cells with, of course, the lymphoid areas being involved. How do we manage these patients that have um, chronic lymphocytic leukemias? You may actually perform watchful waiting in patients that are asymptomatic, those that have a binet A and B, and then you can pretty much do your three monthly FBCs. You can do flow cytometry and routine examinations. Chemotherapy can be given for those that have active as well as symptomatic disease, those that, that are at binet stage C. Yeah, common regimens are like the FCR regimen with uh, fludarabine, um, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, or the newer agents such as uh, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors like ibrutinib. And then, of course, up to 50% remission, but most of them actually tend to relapse.
Stem cell transplants can also be done for those that have refractory disease. Now, what are some of the indications of initiating treatments? In patients that have hemolytic anemia, in patients with cytopenias, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia with recurrent infections, bleeding, then of course disfiguring lymphadenopathies, uh, symptomatic organomegaly, marked systemic symptoms, and even advanced disease, you pretty much want to treat these patients. Now, remember that also in the management of chronic myeloid leukemia, even in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, supportive management is also mandatory. Dated. So meaning that you're going to be covering these patients on antibiotics if they get these infections, if they are bacterial infections, cover them on blocked spectrum antibiotics. If they have anemia, transfuse them with blood. Of course, if they're bleeding tendencies, transfuse them with fresh frozen plasma as well as platelets. So that supportive treatment that we're offering to acute leukemic patients is the same supportive treatment that we also offer to chronic myeloid uh, in chronic lymphocytic patients. And remember that the response to treatment is going to be judged by a decline in the white blood cell count, an increase in the HP and the platelet, and a decrease in the size of the lymph nodes. Some of the complications include recurrent infections from treatment or the disease, a rich transformation to a high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as, co as well as hyperviscosity syndrome. Now, prognosis pretty much depends on the stage. Those that are at stage 0 and 1, they have a pretty much good prognosis. If the patient has stage 0 disease without other poor prognostic factors, then the median survival would be more than 10 years without treatment. Those that are at stage 2 have an intermediate prognosis, so median survival is about 5 years without treatment. Those that are at stage 3 and stage 4 have the worst prognosis, so median survival is about 3 years with or without a treatment. I really hope you enjoyed and you really now understand about both acute and chronic leukemias, especially focusing on chronic leukemias in this lecture. If you did, please drop a like. It helps out the channel. Also drop a comment on what you'd want to learn next. If you want me to cover the lymphomas, if you want me to do any other topics on the channel, that goes a very long way and I do listen to your requests. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and beyond. And